back to the racing. Uh, two races, man, what an eventful weekend. <laughs> God, there were a few big crashes there over the course of the weekend. Um, if I run through, I just wrote, made some notes about race one specifically. Oh, by the way, congratulations too, because I think you uh, broke the lap record or now hold the lap record. Yeah, well, look, it's a new track, so like it's, <laughs> it's uh it's a little bit easier to get the lap record if nobody's had a chance, nobody else has had a chance to ride on it. But um, yeah, over over the course of the weekend, yeah, for sure, we we definitely had the outright speed um over everybody else on that weekend, like through qualifying, obviously qualified pole position, so we had the fastest outright speed there. And then even during the races, um, I think it was the second race where uh yeah i set the set the lap record for the track in during the race so um yeah definitely definitely had good speed that's for sure the bike was working great and everything felt good mate only you would say it's it's easy to do to get a lap record <laughs> against pierce and waters and stuff <laughs> i don't mean it that it's easy i just mean that you know nobody else has had a chance to to, to have a go at it for a long period of time so <laughs> i don't know yeah <laughs> Uh, if we look at race one, um, you qualified on pole, so you started on the front, and then uh, it was interesting because a big difference between race one and race two, or parts of race two, um, Pearson got past you in, into turn one straight away, and then Waters passed in front, and I think for that next nine laps, you know, until it was red flagged, because we had a couple of crashes, uh, Alec and crashed, had a huge high side, and then Starring crashed as well. Um, the three of you kind of created a gap between the rest of the field, you know, and uh, it never changed. It was just you, three of you out in front gradually creeping away and uh, a bit of a window between you and fourth. And I think Ant West had got up to fourth there at some point. Um, they red flagged the race. There was a restart. The After the restart, it was then Pearson, you and Maxi Stofer, right, and... It seemed like, you know, pretty early in that in that second part of the race that you started to run wide a little bit, you know, so you can see there was a couple of run wide and people would pass you. You end up back in eighth, um, and I think that's where you finished. I think you got back to seventh at some point, but then you finished in eighth at one point. Ant West came second, uh, Brock Pearson came first, and Cameron Ducker came third. Yeah, what was your take on that race, particularly in that, you know, the difference between the first and the second parts of it? Yeah, so the big thing about this track is that, like I said, it had been resurfaced and um, so that presents a, a lot of unknown, you know what I mean, in terms of tyre degradation. Uh, so that's why I think for the first the first start of that race, like the first part, um, the, which which ran for about, ran for like nearly half race distance, I think it went for about 10 laps and then it was um, red flagged with the crashes. So that first, that first part for me was kind of like I wasn't being aggressive and I felt like both Brock and Josh were probably a little bit more aggressive initially. Um, I think that they – obviously, track position was a was a big thing there um, because it, it's actually really hard to pass on that track now. Um, you know, like I said before, the way that they've, re, you know, changed some of those turns is – I don't know. I, there's not almost like nearly no, no passing opportunities. It's really, really tough. So, for them, those guys, they got in front of me – from the get go, Brock had a really good start. He led, he whole shot it in the first turn, and Waters was super aggressive into the, I think the third or fourth turn, um, and went past as well. So, I wasn't too stressed at the point though because I felt like it was good having people in front to set the pace. Um, I didn't, I didn't feel like I wanted to be in front setting the pace because I was concerned at how the tire would last throughout the race. Um, being a twenty lap race, it's a long, long, it's a long race there. Um, and so really just sitting in third, I was just, you know, following along really like they were setting a, a, a quick pace. I think it was probably a little quicker than I, than I was expecting um, because uh, I, yeah, just for a 20 lap race, we, we was doing like, you know, we we're doing mid uh, 59 second lap times and the, the qualifying, the qualifying lap time was only, you know, a high, high 58. So we we're only, you know, half a second to, you know, uh, seven tenths sort of slower than the the qualifying time. Um, it was pretty pretty quick. So um, yeah, that first part was more or less just yeah just sitting in trying to let them set the pace and hopefully wait and see what happens towards the second half. But obviously with the red flags, uh, the red flag with, from the crashes, so we restarted again. Um, the problem came. Uh, the problem started for me was that um, I came into the pit lane. 
I, when I seen the crash, I thought the crash was really bad. So I came into the pit lane thinking, okay, got to get the top, got to get the tires onto the tire warmers as quickly as possible. Um, but uh, but what I didn't realise is that they actually wanted this to go to the grid, and um, so there was a, a little bit of a delay between the time it took for me to get back down to the grid and get the bike on the tire warmers, and it was enough there to like create a bit of a problem for getting enough heat back into the tire particularly for the rear the rear tire the front tire we wasn't so much of an issue it was more so for the rear tire um and then there was we had to readjust um we had to move the bike from where we were around onto the grid and um so that meant the tire was had to come off and go back on again so that whole process just meant that we didn't get enough heat or keep enough heat in the tire I actually lost too much um, temperature in the tire and we weren't on the grid for long enough to like regenerate the heat in the in the tire uh so that's where the problem started and then once we restarted the race as soon as i rode off um we do we do us uh like a, a warm-up lap we go out from the grid go out do a warm-up lap come back to the grid and then you start your race so as soon as i left to do the warm-up lap i could already feel the tire was cold like it it almost feels like you've got a flat tire you know when you've got a, when you've got a cold slick it feels like you've got a flat tire and um and i felt that straight away and even though I tried to generate some heat into it on that warm up lap, it's it's not enough. You know, you need to probably need to do two, two at least two laps to sort of get some heat into it. The problem then is that when we come back to the grid, you know, you sit there for a little tiny bit before they start the race, and then you go again. So yeah, this whole time I just not had enough heat in the tire. And when I tried to get going, um, you know, you immediately you try to push because obviously everybody's everybody's going at race pace now you know you start the race you got to get into the race right you don't have time to just ride slowly and build temperature in the tire and when i try to do that what it does is it, it tears the tire um because it's cold it's called creates a cold tear and once that happens it didn't matter even a couple of laps later once the tire generated more heat in it once it's already torn the tire like it, it never come back again so yeah, in those first couple of laps, like you said, you can see I was going wide. I couldn't get the I couldn't get the bike to turn into the corner. I was losing the rear going in. I try and get on the throttle and the thing are just like as if the tires just sitting on top of the on top of the bitumen just pushing across the track. So then I'll go really wide on the exits and yeah, everybody just went past me like at a million miles an hour and I end up, like I said, back in eighth or something. Um and I was able to sort of just hang on there really. Uh, I was lucky I didn't go back any further. But um yeah, such a such a shame because I mean once we've seen what happened in race two, like, I mean, my pet potential for race one was so high, you know what I mean? Like realistically, I, I could have won that race. I should have challenged at least challenged for the win in that race, you know? Um, so to come away with eighth place was, was pretty disappointing and very frustrating as well. Um, you knowing that you could have done so much better, but um, yeah, uh, look, that was, you know, an error on my part. I should have been, should have gotten back to the grid or, you know, analysed that situation a bit better and and not made the choice that I did. So, um, yeah, it's tough, but at the end of the day, I, I stuffed up there and uh, that caused that problem. So that's the way it goes. Um, yeah, but uh, and in terms of the make the that. crashes, <laughs> hey, was that, sorry? Didn't make the mistake in the second one. No, that's it. The second one I was... I'd learned from the first race. I wasn't I wasn't buggering that up again, that's for sure. Uh but um yeah, I was gonna say with the crashes, like you said, there'd been so many crashes through the weekend. And like for us in in uh, you know, in this this weekend, like we had two two races with two red flags, you know, it's pretty uncommon for that to happen. Um I can't actually even remember the last time that it did happen. I don't know. But um yeah, so many, so many crashes through the weekend. I think it's just, you know, the track's so the bitumen's so fresh and so new. Um it was really, really hard to feel like normally, normally you can feel the the tire, particularly, particularly from the, from the rear, you can feel it a lot um, as to, you know, why the limit is and like, you know, you can sort of feel if you're just starting to overstep it, you know, and you can catch it, you know, but um, this, the way the bitumen was being so fresh and not had a lot of rubber down, it was really difficult to feel. So I think that's part of the reason why it caught so many people out um mm. because once it did all it did i know you, you i hear this a lot i hear people say oh i felt like i was doing exactly the same thing when i came around from one lap to the next and i don't know what happened i just fell off and i hear that and i'm like well that's frustrating because you have to have done something different to create the crash right otherwise if you're doing exactly the same thing it wouldn't happen but um you know, in this search situation, I experienced it myself. I'm like, I swear I was doing the identical thing that I was doing the lap before. And you just have a, a slide with the rear tire. And 
it's just so hard to feel it, you know what I mean? Like the smallest changes that you do with your riding or whatever you do with a throttle on the bike, it can just – it can cause the rear to slide out. So, yeah, I think that's why we had, you know, that red flag in that first race and then obviously another one again in the next one. So, yeah, pretty tough weekend. Do they – how much does – like this being a fresh, freshly resurfaced track, I remember in the coverage they were talking about it, the Christopher Mullen and – um uh, what's his name? I, f- oh, I should I've got to remember. Should remember his name. They walked around the. Tra- they walked around the track and uh, you know gave everyone an overview of it, and you could see this thing look, was looking like it had just been you know tarmac a week ago. The, how much does that um, going to a track that's been resurfaced, hasn't got a lot of rubber down, affect your choice of tire compound and things like that? Yeah, well, it affects everything because I mean, through our practice sessions, that that's the that's a big thing that you do. You just you don't uh, you don't turn up knowing which tire to use. You know what I mean? Um, you you've just got to go out there and simply try them all because we have three with the Pirelli. We have two different front compounds or two different front tires that we can use, and then there's three options with the rear as well. So throughout the course of practice we tried all, all different options available to us so we tried the both front tires and we tried all three rear tires to see what was the best um and that's the only way to do it is just trial and error so um and because you know the thing about the tires is, is that some you know one particular type of tire might work better for one brand of bike than it does for another brand of bike even though it's the same track and the same bitumen you know, one bike, you know, the electronics on the bike or the way that it delivers a power or whatever, it might suit one particular tyre better than another one. Um, so, yeah, uh, I, I, I'm not sure what everybody ended up, what type of tyre everybody ended up on. But, yeah, for us, we found that, uh, you know, we found the combination that worked for us during the races and we found, I think everybody ran the soft tyre for the qualifying because, I mean, you, you don't have to have any distance there. You just got to have one outright lap speed, you know. But, yeah. Um, yeah, in terms of the race, there was kind of like really two options to run in the race. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so it, you just not something that you can go there knowing what to do. You've just got to go there with an open mind and try it and see what works. And then the tricky thing is it's 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 not like you can just put the tyre and just expect that it's all the tyre that makes a difference because you might need to spend a bit of time with the setup to make that tyre work, you know what I mean? So it's not like you just, yeah, it's not like you just put the tyre in and then go, oh, well, you get a result and you go, oh, that's perfect or it's no good, you know, you like you might have to spend a bit of time with it to get it to work. So it, you think you've got a fair bit of time during practice. You know, we ended up having Thursday afternoon, we had an hour, we had an hour long session. Friday, we had, I think, three half hour sessions and then um, Saturday morning, we had another half an hour session, I think, as well. So, you know, what do we got all up? We've got, what's that, nearly three hours worth of track time. And at the end of three hours, you're still wishing you had more time. <laughs> you're never ending, never ending just trying stuff. So, yeah, it's it's a tricky process for sure. We, I just went through this at Phillip Island on, the, on that fourth day. I said I, I actually uh, got invited to attend the ride day with uh, Mega and Steve Brogy. And, uh, I thought I'd go out because I hadn't ridden the first three days with school. I spent the um, three days, the three day school in the level four garage. So I go out on the Thursday, and I think it's like eleven degrees or twelve degrees. Like it's freezing if you're in the wind. And the only coach bike that we had available or out of the truck, because I think you know we got twelve coach bikes and a whole bunch of hire bikes. They pulled this one bike out, and it belongs to Damo. And Damo's like I don't know, one hundred and ten kilos. You know Damo. He's like 110 kilos and the bike's set up for him and, and I don't like the way he sets them up. So I'm, I'm riding his bike. It's a brand new hard compound Metzler race tech on the back and it's 11 degree temperatures and they put me in the red group. So I go out and in one lap, that tyre is completely destroyed. It has no traction left and we couldn't even get it back in one in, in one session, not one lap. Um, and, and the big takeaway for me was exactly that, you know, you, you've, the combination between setup and tyre uh, selection, you know, is integral. And secondly, getting the right compound. And, and you know, Philip Island's like at the moment, man, there is some grip there too. So uh, anyway, I had one session and that was it. Couldn't ride that bike anymore. <laughs> Sounds a bit like me in the second part of that first race. <laughs> it's a close to being like Mike Jack. <laughs> yeah, you know what it feels like. <laughs> uh, 
uh race two race two was uh again another one like you said you know there was a red uh there was a red flag in that one um man i watched the replay a couple of times of uh max Dofer's eye side um because basically he's run super wide he's run way off the left hand side of the track and then he's come back on the track like speedway style and massive high side and poor old Ant West has ploughed into him uh, from the Addicted to Track team. And then uh, I think Cameron Dunker ran into um, Ant West's bike. Uh, what's your take on, you know, that, uh, the, you know, the way, the circumstances of that and the way it turned out? Yeah, look, I, that was a huge crash for starters. I'm surprised that it seems like everybody, like, like you said, Max, Cam and Ant are all, you know, like they're obviously sore and whatnot, but they're not, they're, they're okay to a certain extent, you know. I'm surprised because, yeah, it was such a big crash. Um, yeah, look, I think that, you know, obviously it started, uh, the start of it was Max uh, getting into like that turn one one and two sort of, the, the turns one and two a little bit too quickly there and getting out a little bit wide, um, sort of crossing the, because the way they've got the track set up there, they've got the, They've got the track, you've got the ripple strip, and then you've got uh, essentially just a whole section of, you know, bitumen as the safety runoff area. Um, so he's run out into that sort of bitumen part. Um, but you can probably see that it's really quite dirty. Um, and that was a big thing from the weekend was that uh, the track, because it was so just so rushed to get it ready for us to, to race on that, um, you know, when we turned up to ride there the first day, the track itself was actually quite dusty and dirty, even though they tried to clean it as much as they could. It it didn't start to clean up until, the, like, as the weekend went on, you know, I mean, it got cleaner and cleaner. But because out there on that part of the track where Max ended up, at that part of the runoff area where, where Max ended up, it uh, it had it wasn't clean, you know what I mean? It was still quite dirty. So I think he's probably expecting a certain amount of grip from that, you know, bitumen out there. But uh it wasn't there, and like you said, like that once a tire let go, he's it, it's almost like he sort of nearly saved it, you know, like he sort of caught it a bit and had a big slide there for such a long time, um, and ultimately, yeah, it ended up gripping up and flicking him over the high side, and just unfortunate that uh, the bike travelled back into the direction of where you know Ant West was riding, and uh, that legitimately had nowhere to go, you know. What I mean, the bike just his, Max's bike just rode straight into <laughs> straight into Westy, so he, he's up and over the bars and over the over the top. And then same thing for Cam, like he's right behind Westy and straight into the back of his bike. So, um, yeah, just a bad bad set of circumstances there. Typically, typically it would just be a one rider crash, you know what I mean? But the way the bikes, the way Max's bike came back in onto the line was just an unfortunate sort of thing. But um, yeah, I think just. Uh, yeah, ultimately it was just that, that that safety sort of what should be the safety area or runoff area not being clean. I think um, that was sort of uh, yeah made made a bit of a bit more of a problem there than it could have been. You know, had that section been clean, Max probably might have got away with just running out wide and getting back onto the track um, safely. You know, at least just wide and not you know not not, not having a crash. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, tricky one there. But like I said, like you know, there's just there's just the ca that's just the case for this this particular round being so fresh and clean and <laughs> so 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 fresh. Sorry that um yeah, it was just you know when we're at a lot of the other circuits because the tracks have been run in for so long, you just you know you you get what you expect. You know what I mean? Like you know what what the way that it is. You know how much grip you've got available. You know what's 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 uh, even in the runoff areas, you know what you've got. But this, yeah, this was just that little bit different because it was so, so, so fresh. It's an area of the track, like you say, no one rides there. I it's down at Manton Park in Townsville where it's it's an, a, a track that sits out in an open plain. There's a lot of dirt around. You get a bit of a breeze. And, of course, it blows in the direction of turn one, which is right at the end of the straight, right? So you go to a right-hand turn through one, so 180-degree turn, and of course, it blows dirt on it. And um, the, the last time I was down there, we did exactly that. Just ran a little bit wide, uh, a little bit too fast on the entry. Holy mackerel, man, the traction changes when it's got dirt or, you know, dust or cars have been on it and things like that. Um, is this particular track, because I get a sense that it's out there in the open as well and it can be affected by wind and breeze. Yeah, well, that was a big thing on the weekend. Like the, the wind picked up. 
I think from Saturday, like Saturday and Sunday, it was very, very windy. Um, even especially Sunday, it was crazy winds there Sunday. And I think to like, I, I'm sure I, I imagine it getting better in that um, because the because the edge all the all the edges of the track, you know, like they're just they're just dirt at the moment. Like there's not a there's I think they're trying to go go and try to have grass grow there, or you know they're trying to do something about it. But for the moment, like it's a lot of dirt around. Um, like I said, they've moved they've moved so much dirt around to create the the mounds around the outside of the track to try and cope with the noise. So there's that as well. Um, so yeah, look, there's definitely definitely for, from our point of view on the weekend, it wasn't ideal, but I feel like they they have they have they they're going to use that you know what they've learnt from the weekend and they'll try to make it better, um, and that hopefully won't be a problem in the, in the future. Um, you know, once they get a bit of grass down and stuff like that, but um, yeah, I mean, and it's a hard one too because you look at like they go and they race a GP in Qatar and you know it's in the in the bloody desert and they got the the sand that blows all over the track there. So it's it's a tough one because even at world championship level that they have problems with things, you know, and it's not always perfect. So I mean, uh even for us, you know, like of course we wanted it we want it to be better or and all that kind of thing, but um that's just the circumstances. And I guess the reality is you got to ride to the conditions that are around, you know, so that the ultimately it ends up like you know, the responsibility lies on you. So um but hopefully yeah hopefully in the future you know once they've had a bit more they have some other events on the on the track and um they have a bit more time to finally clean some more things up and um that kind of thing it, i think it will be it'll be okay yeah but, and and everyone's got to deal with the same thing it's not like it's unfair or anything so that's yeah, right that's it. yeah everybody's everybody's in the same boat so yeah that's uh, that's racing yeah exactly um race 2 uh, sorry the restart uh, I, I I did have a chuckle because I was watching. Um, they they spent a bit of time in that restart talking to people, and uh, Christopher Mullen walked walked around and he and he he spoke to you about it as well, but then focused on your bike because you know he was aware of the temperature issues. And I noticed that the rear wheel of your bike this time was wrapped up and like had fourteen blankets on it and seven seventeen tire warmers. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the question <laughs> is. How much um, attention do you have to give to keeping heat in the rim and all the componentry as well? Because it's not just the rubber, I would assume. Yeah, that's it. And that's why you put, you know, the tie warmers that we have, they've got the, uh, like a flap or a type of cover that go also goes over the rims as well. So the whole, the whole tire, the rim, everything gets, gets, uh, gets heated up. Um, and then, you know, like we, when we did on the grid, we added and, and any time that it's typically when it's cold or it's windy it, it, in and around the garage, we'll also add like a, a, a co another cover on top of it as well, which goes, it covers everything again, like it basically covers from the, the, the tire down to the ground. So they can't get any wind in there and, you know, any, any of the cold, cold air can try and keep as much of the cold air out as possible. So. Yeah, obviously in a, in the warmer temperatures it's not so much of an issue. You just chuck your tire warmers on and it's it's not as big of a deal um, because the air temperature is just warm enough anyway, you know. But um, but for sure, once when it's cold, it's really important to try and keep the not just the getting the tire hot, but yeah, getting the rim hot. And that's I I don't know exactly how long they put the warmers on the tires for before that we go to use them. But it's a few, it's, it's, I think it's somewhere between two and three hours. Like it's a, it's a long time that we, because typically most people, I think like if you're doing a track day or whatever, you try and get your tires on the, on the warmers for like about an hour, you know what I mean? Which is good for the rubber. That That's, that's fine to heat up the rubber. But if you want to heat up the, the rim and everything, like you said there, then it's got to be a good couple of hours at least to try and generate all that heat into everything, you know? And, it not only does it then get the heat into everything, what it does it just creates consistency. Like, you know, once once the rubber, the air inside the tire, the rim, all that stuff is all at the same temperature or, or close to, then you're gonna have a lot more consistency with your with your tire pressures as well and, and that kind of thing. So you're not having so much, you know, uh, problem with tire temperature loss out once you get out on the track. So yeah, it's pretty pretty key to get on top of all that sort of thing, especially when we're at the level that we're at. You know, and like I said to you, you could see in that first race, it might not have been that much that we actually lost tire temperature, but it was enough to create such a big problem. So that's why it's so critical, you know, to to get it right and do it properly.
Uh, the restart, solid start. I think uh, you're in second from memory. Uh, Pearson was in first from the, you know, the, the, the grid positions on the restart. And uh, you led into turn one. You actually did a Pearson on Pearson. <laughs> it was awesome. Um, <laughs> yeah. And you were never had the whole time. So. I'll just I'll just correct you on that. Maybe want to do it again because it was Waters that Waters was on the on the pole. He he's he restarted on pole because he was in the lead for the for the first part of the race. Yeah, I got the numbers back in front. It was yeah. Yeah, that, that's right. So do you do you want to do that a bit again so that yeah, <laughs> 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 I mean you know turn one straight into the lead. You were never headed. Um, I think in that second phase they did twelve laps. In the, from the restart, and uh, you actually created a bit of a gap on the rest of the field. It was, you didn't, you know, like if anyone did it easy, it was probably you in the front there. So, uh, what was your take on that, you know, race from the restart? Yeah, look, I mean, like I said, we 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 had the the tire temperature thing wasn't a problem for this race. We had that down pat. We did actually make a small adjustment to the motorbike from race one to race two, which. I could feel was a benefit to me in that in the first part of the race. Um, so when we made the restart, I was very confident that if I could just get in front and get going, knowing that now we're, we were kind of almost at half race distance, essentially, you know what I mean? We're at that sort of 12 lap mark. So um, it meant that I could just sort of get, if I could get to the front, it just meant that I could just put my head down and get going, you know, whereas if we, when you're trying to do the full, you know, 20 lap race, I I was like I said to you, even in that second race, I was still a bit conservative in the beginning, um, just knowing that you had to go the full distance. Whereas this was okay. This is more just like an outright sprint, you know. And um, and so I, yeah, got a made a really good start um, and got to the front straight away. And exactly that, just put my head down, just got into it. I think you know I opened up, started to open a gap e even on that first like from the standing start from on that first lap. I opened up a little bit of a gap there, and um, and then yeah, my next I think few laps like. That's where the lap record was. I did a 59-0, which is crazy to think to, that I was able to go that fast on the race tyre when the my qualifying time was a 58.8. A so I was only two tenths off the <laughs> off the off the uh, off the qualifying time. So I really just yeah, I really got stuck in. And um, once I could see out like each lap, you know, seeing the pit board just open up, you know, a couple tenths or a few tenths each sort of lap there, it was um, I and I, I I don't know, I just felt so good on the bike, like I didn't. I, the the bit that I was worried about with the tire, you know, starting to lose some grip or whatever, even even with a twelve, even at twelve laps, like I didn't have my tire felt really good. My bike was still really stable and um, very pre precise and predictable, and so I just kept I just kept hammer down. I didn't I didn't back off at all. I just <laughs> this felt great, so I just kept going. And I think we ended up at two, like nearly nearly two and a half seconds gap by the end of it. So um, yeah, very like I said, very comfortable. Bike felt great. I felt great. It was just, it was the best ever, you know. Like it's um, it's pretty hard. It's normally pretty hard to ra to do a race like that. Um, and so when you can do it, um, especially at the the caliber, like the, the level of the field that we're at, you know what I mean. To be able to create a, you know, a more than a two second gap in a short r sprint race like that, twelve laps, like yeah, to me it just felt like domination. Like I just felt I felt amazing, and yeah, it was really really good. You yeah, like. I was looking at that like in the in the first half of the race, um, you know, Josh was quite aggressive, you know, and Brock Pearson's aggressive on it. And you, as you said, like just a little bit more conservative. Then you get a red flag, so any gap that is there is kind of pulled back again, right? They take the gap out. How much does the fact that they've effectively worn their tires more than you factor into this? Because now, you, now you're basically all starting again, and you've got a better tyre. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, I suppose, like I said, that first how many laps we just we must have done about seven or eight laps in that first sort of stint, and yeah, being slightly more conservative than them, and just trying to look after it a little bit more. I'd say, um, yeah, for sure, it plays a part. Um, you know, when they're at the front and they're trying to put the hammer down and they're, they're trying to get going, you know, like uh, it each 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 corner of each lap, you know, you just you just burn it off that little bit more rubber. So. Um, the more that you can conserve, like conserve that, um, the better for sure. And you know that was evident, obviously, in the restart um, as well for me to just have that maybe that little bit extra over them there with the tire. But um, yeah, I think that's where my mindset was for the whole twenty laps. You know, like I, it, 
was better to be a little bit gentle on the bike, you know, in the beginning than rather than just sort of try to put the hammer down right from the beginning, you know, not until we had that restart, you know, you've only got a 12 lap run. Well, then you can, then you can, you know what I mean? Then you don't have to worry about distance so much. You can just, you can just pull the pin and get going. Well, you've done, well, you've done the opposite in the past, like at Phillip Island and then uh, right at the end. That's exactly right. And I've, I've had that experience, which is probably what, what, what meant that I tried to be a bit more conservative this time around because, yeah, when you when you try to go too early and um, like I said, like we've had it at Phillip Island, try to go too early and try to go hard at the start, and then you get you get to towards the end of the race and you've got absolutely no tire left. So yeah, it's it's a it's a balance, like it's a balancing act. You know what I mean with with your tire, like how how hard do I push and when do I do it? You know, so it's tricky. Um, and sometimes you get it right and sometimes you don't. <laughs> People get a real sense of that. You know, you watch MotoGP and um, you know. You see a rider get out the front, and then they, you know, it looks like they got to win by a, you know, a big margin, and then then slowly second and third catch up and close the gap. It's it, it's definitely becoming more evident, you know. And I always wonder how much of that is, you know, the fact that the riders are getting better and the bikes are getting hard, you know, are riding much more aggressively, or you know, there's more power and that type of thing on pretty much the same tires. Yeah, well, I look at. I just watched the. Uh, I can't remember if it which race it was, and I think it must have been Motegi. Just watch Motegi. Um, and, like, Peko Bagnaio was out the front. Jorge Martin was second. Uh, and you see with about, I think it must have been from about six laps to go, and Martin started to close the gap down to, to Peko, like there was a, you know, a couple second gap or whatever it was, or one and a half, you know, one and a half second gap. And you've seen, you seen Martin, he put, started to put the hammer down. And he started to close that gap in, and he got it down to under a second, I think. And he was he was he was coming for Peko, and then at a you know a certain moment there, like Peko, I, I don't I didn't look exactly what happened at the lap times whether Martin slowed up or Peko started to go faster again, but you know like it's just about that like managing that you know what I mean the tire management you know I feel like Martin he put the hammer down but he could he could only do that for you know whatever it was three four maybe five laps and then you know and then. Peko still, although he's just been banging out the same lap times and hasn't been wearing the tire extra hard or any harder than he was before, and then he gets to a certain moment and now he can use his, use that tire that he saved and he can pull the gap back out again, you know. So, yeah, it's pretty incredible to watch, that's for sure. And I think like when you're like in a position that I'm in as a rider and I understand all that stuff, like it's 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 even more cool, you know what I mean? Like, I guess when you're watching from the outside on the TV and you just see the gap close down and it goes back out again, you might not really understand why it happened or what happened. But, you know, I, I feel like, yeah, when I watch it and I see it happen, it's like, I uh, get get why. And it's, yeah, it's pretty, pretty, it's pretty awesome to see and to see like at those guys at that level, how uh, refined they are and to be able to control that stuff. I always wonder how, yeah, you know, like, and, and you're, you're a guy who could, be in a position to experience this and answer this, how much do you have to really think about being patient? You know, you know, the temptation is to go out and just push hard kind of thing. I mean, how does, how do you deal with that temptation? Yeah. Well, I suppose, I mean, like, like I said, I've done, I've done both now, you know what I mean? I've, I've gone hard from the start and, and it doesn't work. And you, then, then you've done the other one where you sort of steady on a little bit and then try and wait for the right time. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it is. It's really hard because obviously in the beginning of the race, when the tyres brand new, that's when the bike feels its best. You know, you've got a lot of grip, so you do. You just want to get, you just want to get into it. You know what I mean? Like, uh, and it's easy to do that. And um, the hard bit, like I said, is to resist that temptation and try to just know how to, you know, uh, still be reasonably quick, but just just not being as a, aggressive on everything, you know, just treat that little bit smoother with the throttle, try to pick the bike up that little bit more on the exits. Um, and it's and really, I think from a mindset point of view, it's just, you're just riding to a strategy, you know, like you've got to have that plan in your head before you go out to the, do the race. Like if you just get out there and just run on, run on what happens in front of you, then I think you'd easily get set up into just pushing hard straight away. Whereas if you've got a plan in your head, okay, I'm going to try to ride, you know, whatever it is, five laps, 10 laps, you know, try to be as conservative as I can with the bike. And then from a certain lap number, okay, now I'm going to go. If you've got that plan in your head before you go out there, then I think that's probably the best way to do it. You, do you utilize the pit board at all 
to help you manage that because you're not getting you, you, you have no reference to speed you have no reference you know from a data perspective to lap times and things like that how much do you use the pit board if you do and how much do you rely on just visual you know observations about where people are yeah so i'm very fortunate on the on the dash of the bike we actually get the lap time each lap so i can see what the, the lap time is each lap um the pit board is super critical to know how many laps to go like the information that i get on the board is is laps to go uh because i can't count while i'm riding right <laughs> i can't count down the laps while i'm riding um laps to go and uh usually it's just the gap to who's who's behind you um you know what whatever that gap is to the person behind you uh Oh, the other the other bit of information is obviously you can see what's in front of you. So, you know, I, I can I can gauge what lap time I'm doing when I come around and I can gauge the gap to the guy or the guys that are in front of you, you know what I mean? Like you might see, let's say, for example, um, you know, on a weekend there was a situation where Waters was directly in front of me and we were lapping at about a similar pace. Brock was ahead of him, but I could see that his gap was opening up. You know, he was going faster than what we were, so – you know, I can tell that he's going quicker than whatever we're doing. Um, the other bit of information that I use is, is looking at just what the other bikes in front of me are doing and how they're looking. So, and if they're making mistakes or whether they're super consistent, because that sort of tells me as to how close or how far on the edge they are. So, yeah, in terms of trying to manage everything, like you do have, you know, got a little bit of information on what's going on behind you. You've got your own information as to what you're doing on the track. I'm not sort of relying on my sensation of speed as such, I'm definitely relying on a lap time, the physical lap time to know how fast I'm going. Um, I'm relying on my feeling and my sensation with the tires um, and how the bike's handling underneath me and, and what I can get away with it doing. Um, and then obviously, yeah, the guys in front of me, I'm analyzing them as well. So um, like I said, in that first part of that race, or first part of both races, I'm riding to uh, looking at the lap time thinking, okay, this is very quick. It's it's still fast. I'm trying to manage the bike underneath me and feeling the the tires underneath me by not not just ripping the gas open. I'm trying to be gentle with the roll on with the throttle and feeling that as I'm coming off the turn, trying to pick the bike up, getting it up onto the top part of the tire, trying to help the tire the edge of the tire stay better for longer. And in the moments that I was behind those guys, I can see that they they might be a little bit faster than me in some sections. They might be pulling a small little bit of a gap, but it's nothing to be super concerned about. If they're just starting to walk away from you, obviously then you can't keep being conservative. You're going to have to get into it and, and get going, you know what I mean? But in a situation like that, you can be a little bit more conservative and still run a similar pace to them. Um, so, yeah, it's a it's – a, it's a, and you look, and the problem is, is we didn't get to run a full race distance to sort of like put an actual strategy in place. Like I said, it was just – end up doing about half race distance then we had a stoppage and then it's like you well you start again you know what i mean so and with the restarts because they've because they were relatively short um in that they were sort of wrap around half race distance and it, like so the strategy sort of starts to go out the window a bit at that point is just you just got to get into it get going from that point you know did you uh I, have you watched the races back well, i have yeah yeah i did yes yep Notice the lines that Ant was taken through that uh, big right hand area because he, he passed. Yeah, yeah, the big, the big sweeping, the the bowl, the bowl section, the last, the last section. Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, and it was actually pretty impressive because, like I said, it's pretty hard to pass on the track, and he was finding a way to to ride up the inside of. I think he might have been Allerton and maybe Max Stouffer. I don't know, passed somebody else, but yeah, really tight line. Um, with just a little bit more speed because the way that turn is you sort of I, I sort of find that you can run in into it with a lot of speed but then you have to sort of if you run into it with a lot of speed then you have to sort of slow up in the middle part of it to try and get the lot like turn the bike back and then because it's so long again then you end up running sort of a constant radius until you've got to tighten it up at the end so that's a typical sort of line I think that you run but he was finding a way to get in there maybe just to just a little bit slower, but got him on a tighter line. And then in the middle of it, he was, because he was on a tighter line, he could actually run a lot more turn speed in the middle. And at the moment that the, that anybody else was sort of having to slow up or try to get the bike to turn back again, that was the moment he was able to be faster and get up the inside of him. And there was nothing that they could do because he's already on the inside, you know. So pretty impressive, to be honest. <laughs> it's pretty crafty, that's for sure. Cool. Like it was like a super sport line, you know. It, was, it, it wasn't yeah. a 
like line. It was, you know, it'd be like hugging the inside completely on turn two at Phillip Island. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yep, yep, exactly like that. It's very cool. Um, the results, so if you look at the results, I think the key the key for you was to be ahead of Josh, um, though you only got two points ahead in that final round. However, um, currently positioned at uh, first position is Josh Waters on 256.5 points. You're in second position. Congratulations, 229.5. Brock Pearson in third, 219. And then uh, what have we got? Crew Halliday, Max Sofa, Cameron Dunker, Ant West, Arthur Sissies, Glenn Alton, and then John Lytris down in 10th position. So uh, congratulations, mate. You know, you're uh, in a pretty solid position there. How do you feel about the final round? You've got one more round at the bend. How's that going to pan, pan out for you? Yeah, so obviously finish up the weekend, second overall was a good result. But like I said, we, we didn't really call the points back on Josh that we, we, we potentially could have, you know what I mean? Essentially, if we were to come away with the race win in the first race, which I think we had the potential to do, then that would have brought, you know, a fair bit more points back. But um, we, we, we've, we've, we sort of stayed... Yeah, a couple of points. We're more or less stagnant with Josh then after that round. Um, and he's got the fair bit of a lead there. So what's that? It's about 27, somewhere around 27 points. So he's got, yeah, so he's got, he's got, a, he's got like a whole race up his sleeve. So, you know, even if he was to have a, a DNF um, in one of the next races, he, he, he could still be leading the, still be leading the championship. So it's pretty tough there in terms of looking at the outright championship. But stranger things have happened in the past. You never really know with racing. You can't say it's over until it is. So we keep, we keep, um, we keep. Uh, I, I just go to the next round, like with the same mentality of trying to, trying to perform my best and try to win, because it, that'll keep, that'll keep some pressure on him. You know, what I mean, he has to. He then he'll still, he still has to ride his best to earn the championship. So um, at the very least, e even if uh, nothing changes in, in, with the result, then he'll have earned it. You know what I mean? So um, yeah, that's, that's the focus there. I mean, we've got to also look at uh, we're in a race for second place with, with Brock, you know, he's only, I think he's only maybe 10 or 11 points behind us at the moment. Um, yeah. So it's pretty, pretty tight there. Um, we, because we have uh, the next round, we actually have, um, I think three races at the next round of the bend. So, you know, there's, a, there's an extra race, a lot of points up for grabs there. So we need to keep, uh, we need to keep our, yeah, keep on our, on our toes there. And, um, and, you know, again, you have to keep performing because otherwise, you know, there's a good chance there that that second place will get away from you. So, um, yeah, there's no, there's no, it doesn't matter whether you're racing for first, second or third, you got to, <laughs> you, you just got to keep turning up and doing your best, you know, and, you know, look, Brock's been making some good progress. Um, he's had some really good, you know, strong performances in like these last couple of rounds and, uh, you know, got, got a couple of wins. So, and that's where the big thing is like when you win in races, you claw back points pretty quickly. Cause you got, you got a five point gap between first and second. And obviously say, for example, in that first race, where he won the race and I finished in eight. So he, I don't know how many points it was, but he clawed back like, you know, nearly nine points or something in, in one race. So um, yeah, bottom line is don't, uh, we can't have any more, um, we can't have any bad races basically like, like what's happened at, um, you know, say Phillip Island and then also here this weekend. So that's if we want to, that's if we want to keep the pressure on Josh and we want to retain, you know, at least second place in championship. So, but in saying that, um, confidence is high heading into the bend. It's a track that, um, you know, I've, I've won there in the past. Uh, we had a reasonably good result there in the past last year. Um, you know, there's no reason why we can't go well again. Um, it's a track that I like. Uh, it's, it's another, it's a big sort of open track, a little bit more of a bigger open track that might suit, you know, the Dukes a little bit more. They can sort of stretch their legs a bit more there, but, um, and maybe just use that, to their advantage slightly more than they have been able to at like, you know, places like QR or Morgan park or even Wakefield park. So that'll be a little bit more challenging than it probably has been, but nonetheless, the bike works great there. Like I said, we've, we've been able to do well there. So um, yeah, I'm honestly going there looking for a strong result. I, I go there thinking that I can challenge, challenge for the win there. I think that that's a realistic expectation to have um, for that round. So yeah, it's only a, it's only another, well, I think four weeks away maybe until we're, until we're there. So we'll find out soon. Awesome.
Will Crew be racing? Crew didn't turn up, uh, didn't race at uh, one raceway. Yeah, so he he had a bad crash. He rode he he started and he rode Thursday afternoon, um, the first laps on the track, and he had a really bad high side. Um, landed pretty heavily on the ground. It was a very it was a, actually quite a slow crash, but just that's that doesn't determine how 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 sore you get. It's usually the slower ones that hurt you the most. So yeah, had a had a bad crash. Happened actually right in front of me in this in that new section, that long sweeping right hand bowl. Um, yeah, rear and just stepped out on him and and high sided him. So he was he ended up riding um, Friday and Saturday. So he qualified for the races, but um, once it, by the time it came Sunday, he was just in too much pain to partake in the races. So he didn't end up starting either of the races. But uh, from what I understand, he's not actually broken anything. Um, just a lot of lot of pain and. Theoretically, with four weeks break, he should be back for the next round, I, I imagine. Well, crew, if you're listening, we hope you're there, mate. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It was a bit strange, to be honest, Um, it, it's, uh, to go out and go racing without him going out on the track. Like, I mean, uh, I think every, there's not been a race where that's happened. I've Every other race, we roll out of the pit garage together. So, um, And, you know, that level of, you know, we have a level of... Um, competitiveness between us which is which is makes it exciting in the garage but uh yeah it was really weird i was just going out on my own and doing my own thing so um yeah hope to have him i'm not sure he will be but i hope to have him back on the track um it's always it's always that little bit of extra entertainment <laughs> when you got your teammate in the garage <laughs> uh, that's cool um now we're gonna wish you guys luck uh, the yamaha team and uh be interesting <laughs>